Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Penka Bergman, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at Chicago Booth, based on our spectacular new London campus. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is great to see so many of you here. The virtual engagement of our faculty, students, alumni, and staff over the last year has been amazing. And today, I'm personally very excited to have Julia Golden on the program. Our session is being recorded, and you will be hearing three of us speak, Dean Rajan, Julia, and myself. All other participants will be muted. However, we want uh, you to participate by asking questions. To do that, type a question in the Q&A box at any time during the program. Our presentation will last for 30 minutes, sorry, for 60 minutes, excuse me. Dean Rajan and Julia will speak, and then we will have ample time for questions from you. The session is being recorded, and we will make it available to you and our Distinguished Speaker Series website. On behalf of Chicago Booth, thank you for joining us. We know you have a lot of challenges and demands for your time and attention, so we appreciate your interest. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome Madhav Rajan, Dean and George Fred Schultz Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth. Madhav, over to you. Thank you, Penka. Thank you everyone for taking time to be with us today. I'm thrilled that you could be here as we welcome Booth alumna Julia Golden of Lego Group to our Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, the Distinguished Speaker Series is a longstanding Chicago Booth tradition and it brings high profile leaders from business, from the government, from the community to the school to share their experience and insights. We moved the DSS series to virtual last August when the pandemic struck. Uh, and it's been very successful in this format. Uh, we began by speaking to Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft, uh, Tom Ricketts of the Chicago Cubs, Jenny Scanlon of UL and many others and learned a great deal about these executives and how their companies responded to COVID. And the series was so successful, we continued through the summer and the fall. Uh, we've had great conversations with Ann Mukherjee from Perno Ricard North America, JP Gan of Ince Capital in Shanghai, Dave McLennan, CEO of Cargill and many others. And most recently we chatted with Kunal Kapoor, the CEO of Morningstar just a few weeks ago. I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Julia Golden is Chief Product and Marketing Officer of Lego Group where she leads and inspires the creation of Lego play experiences for kids. So her team is responsible for uh, developing the product portfolio and experience, as well as marketing and building the brand through content, communication, and digital channels. So Julia oversees product development, marketing, research and insights, licensing partnership, and the group's in-house creative agency. Before joining Lego in 2014, Julia was Global Chief Marketing Officer at Revlon, and she also had a 13-year career with the Coca-Cola company, where she held several senior global and regional marketing roles, including Division Marketing Director for Northwest Europe and Deputy CMO for Japan. Thank you so much for being with us today, Julia. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Uh, so I thought maybe we would begin by asking you what were some of the sort of more important career experiences that that led you to uh, Lego? It's a very, very good question. Um, to be honest, I've always been very consistent with where my passion was. You know, for me, marketing was always a, a crossroads between arts and science. And I loved, you know, the understanding of human insight that was so important, but then the development of really great programs that also deliver great value, which, you know, in essence, you have to combine business acumen and, you know, really strong understanding of what you're going to deliver and how, but at the same time, you also have to be creative and visionary. And I've always really loved that com those combinations. So you could say, you know, I've been super consistent with my choices, even though they've been in very different industries. Coke was an amazing brand where the brand was so much bigger than the product experience, but the product experience was very special and really mattered. And it was probably the best marketing academy you could possibly have. Uh, Revlon was an opportunity to learn even more about product development because it's an intensely innovation-driven industry. And at the same time, it's also an industry of creating dreams. 
um, you know, so, so that was really great as well. And, you know, I think all the roles sort of came together with the Lego group because we have on top of having amazing innovation and unbelievably exciting brand with tremendous opportunities, we also have a very strong purpose and mission. And I really wanted um, to be in a company that was very purposeful. So I truly, you know, love the fact that our mission is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. And we really, really mean it. Like kids are absolutely at the center. They are role models. They're at the center of what we do. They're number one priority and we're super focused on engaging with them in all kinds of different ways. So I think those were sort of, you know, I think my career was actually quite consistent if you look at the big things that really always mattered to me. But I was really um, lucky to be able to experience tremendous amount of diverse experiences. I moved around the world. I worked in different industries. And I think all of that really helped me. So we, we had some questions that audience submitted in advance. So I'll sort of intersperse them as I go through. And one of them was, if you look back at your career, what were some big bets that you made, which at that time you thought, you know, may or may not have had a high payoff or a low probability that ended up being good and, and others that didn't? Yeah, it's a really good question uh, because I think always in our careers, we are stuck with that, you know, these kinds of decisions. I would say that overall, you know, I think we are always concerned about, you know, it, it's always more difficult to be uncomfortable, right? So sometimes the more uncomfortable situations are the ones that are more, most difficult. It's more di most difficult to say um, yes to, number one. And number two, I think there's a mindset around, you know, making something a success. Because I think in many cases, when things are difficult, when you begin, you might think that that was a mistake. But I can tell you that the most difficult uh, moves that I made that maybe seemed very challenging in the very beginning turned out to be the most rewarding where I learned the most. Mm -hmm. And if I have any regrets that I would say have been bad decisions, it's when I decided not to take the risk. So I'll just give you a few examples. Mm -hmm. I mean, my maybe first um, or very kind of iconic move that was really challenging was a move to Japan because Firstly, um, the Japanese um, um, market and the Japanese culture, uh, you know, they operate very, very differently from anything I have experienced in the past. And it's really challenging to succeed there, especially as a woman, as a senior woman, as a um, foreigner. Um, so I had all kinds of challenges that came with the job, especially because I looked after the product portfolio and Coke that was actually uniquely Japanese. It was just developed for Japan. And I had to learn a lot. And I could tell you that the first, you know, six to 12 months I felt were, you know, were just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people at that time say, wow, that was a mistake and they quit. But I personally decided to stay with it. And at the end of the day, I learned a ton about leadership, about leading in a very different culture, about finding a way to understand very different consumer base, very different people that you work with and to succeed in that culture. So for me, that was a seminal experience. And um, that was obviously a, a very big decision that I could go back to and say that that, that taught me a hell of a lot. Um, and I think gave me uh, you know, a tremendous opportunity. And I would definitely say that that experience really paved the way for me to then you know, work in Revlon and in, in the Lego group. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those would be that, that would be like a really good example. The one thing I really regret is when I said no to things. And the one thing that I did say no to was to switch to um, a general uh, management role earlier in my career and take a commercial role because I always was on a great marketing path and I really loved marketing. And there was always a, the next like really great marketing job to go to. Um, but if I were to advise myself now, I probably would have said I should have taken a sidestep um, and, and done a general management, you know, a sales role or a general management role sometime in the earlier stages of my career. Because when you get further and further into your career and you're going to the top, it's more difficult to make that switch. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, that's one of the things that I regret not doing. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, thank you. That was very insightful. Uh, if you look at your role at Lego now, you're doing not just the marketing, but also the product development part. I mean, was that a deliberate choice? And, and how do you sort of manage to combine those two, those two areas? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to be honest, that's why I sort of go back to my experience in Japan, because, you know, Coca-Cola is not really uh, an innovation, um, like product development company, because, well, you know, there are only very few products and generally speaking, and they don't change so much. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but in Japan, it was very much product innovation driven because we have Georgia Coffee and, that, you know, we innovated that business and that's the business that I worked on. So I really learned how to do innovation then, you know, because there's a process, there's a stage gate process you need to understand for product development. Um, and that really paved the way because I did the same thing at Revlon. I also looked after the product portfolio and I'm doing the same in the level group. And for me, it's become, um, you know, a massive part of my role that I enjoy very, very much because, you know, it, it gives me an opportunity to truly be at the center of what we create for kids. And we need to think very holistically, um, especially in the industry that I'm in, where you are brand product led, so to speak, as a, as a company. Um, so you can't have marketing coming after uh, or, you know, in a sequential way that doesn't work anymore. Marketing has to be integrated into the whole development. And I really very much think of the marketers in my organization as a real product owners, um, mm -hmm. because you, you really have to own, you know, the innovation, the core, what your product represents. And for us, the building experience has to be very consistent with the overall positioning of a franchise or a theme. So it all comes together. So I would say that for me, this is, um, you know, it's, it's not that I have to balance two very different things. It gives me a massive opportunity to actually bring things together and truly develop things in a 360 kind of, it, as, you know, in a 360 sort of degree approach, uh, you know, more so than in any other company where, you know, where I've been before, more so than I have experienced anywhere else. I really, my mantra at work is one team because I have so many different um, aspects of the whole kind of experience chain. I don't want to call it marketing because it becomes very narrow in the way people think about it. But I would say it's, an ex it's, it's, a, it's a consumer experience from physical product to digital product to you know, a marketing campaign to a content they might see to um, experience they might have in the Legoland Park. Um, so it's very holistic. And I have a mantra of one team because the experiences might differ depending on what uh, part of the portfolio you're talking about, who the audience is, what their passions are, but different functions need to be able to come together and work very seamlessly. So that's the way that we are, we tend to work. Mm -hmm. Was there some uh, level of sort of skepticism among the people you had to overcome because you were coming into this new role when you were coming sort of from marketing and, and how did you go about trying to, uh, to, to solve that situation? Um, for sure. Um, to be honest, the skepticism was not so much that I was coming, it, it, you know, I, I also had product development when I was at Revlon, but I was coming from a cosmetic, you mm -hmm. know, company, you know, that did beauty products and I was coming into the Lego group and in the Lego group, I have to say, we have very committed people and some people have been there, you know, all their lives, really, <laughs> they built with Lego's children and then they just went on to build with Lego's adults and, and they, um, you know, for sure, you know, felt that it was really important to understand the Lego brick. It was very important to understand, you know, how the sets came together, you know, how everything was developed. And there was a lot of skepticism about my ability to truly understand that. Um, on the other hand, there was a lot of appreciation of the external experiences that I brought and the marketing know-how that I brought. Um, but to be honest, the way to overcome anything is to be authentic and open about what you don't know, and then to kind of dive in and experience it and understand and learn. And I, and I think over time, I was able to demonstrate to my to myself and to my team that I truly understood how things came together, but I'm also constantly learning. Um, you know, I don't know what I don't know, but I built hell of a lot with the Lego, you know, bricks. I tried different sets and I tried to understand, you know, I, and I, you know, really kind of put efforts into understanding the craft of, of, of developing new products. 
Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I think external, what I think my team really appreciates and what's been really important to me is to demonstrate the benefit of external experience and a different point of view. Uh, because what happens is if is everything is um, homegrown and you kind of continue with that, you become very iterative. It's just uh, inevitable. And there is a power in understanding what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you have to continuously increase the sphere of knowledge that you have. The more you increase your sphere of knowledge, the more you increase your awareness of what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And the more likely you are to challenge the status quo. Mm -hmm. So you need challenges. You need different perspectives. And one of the things that I brought into my organization at the level group is the focus on diversity and making sure that we bring people with different experiences from different industries mm -hmm. um, and different functional areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, into the organization. And that has also really led to, um, you know, a much more um, extensive and broader, ex let's say extensive and expensive innovation mindset within the organization. Um, you mentioned innovation. And one of the questions I had was about how do you think about innovation in the time of COVID? Has COVID affected Lego? How have you been managing to keep the team together, presumably virtually? I think COVID required everybody to be innovative because we all had to, had to get used to doing things differently. You know, I, mean, I have an, a big organization. A lot of people were used to sitting together, like our designers, for example, they build with the bricks. So they always have to be in, 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 you know, in, in, in the, um, uh, you know, in the offices. So we had to get used to different ways of working. Um, so that was definitely already an innovation uh, in, its, in, in its kind. Um, but I think the other thing, of course, is that, you know, we, we had to, um, you know, be very sensitive to what was happening in the external environment and respond to it. And, you know, we did that um, in, in multiple different ways um, throughout the year. I mean, we had a very strong year for the Lego Group uh, last year, um, driven very much for the fact that we had very strong innovation. Now, it's not Product innovation, you know, you can't do overnight. <laughs> so it was planned. Um, the big challenge we had was how to deliver all of the innovation that we had planned and how to go to market when, you know, you have planned big campaign in, in your stores, but all the stores are closed. Um, so, you know, or we have, you know, we plan to shoot a lot of commercials, but yeah, I can't shoot anywhere mm -hmm. because no one is working. So we really had to innovate many different ways, things, uh, go to market strategies, the way to launch products, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you know, we were very successful last year, I think, because we were able to deliver uh, very diverse uh, and very relevant and engaging experiences to many uh, more kids around the world, but also to parents and also to adults. Uh, we had more products designed for adults in our portfolio. It was intentional, but it came at the very right time when adults really needed something to keep them occupied. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that we did initially, you know, literally two weeks, well, the first week that we were all went on lockdown, um, we spoke with, the t with my team and decided that we needed to respond to the world and we needed to respond to the fact that there were so many families, kids were off school, you know, so, so many families that were dealing with very difficult situations. So we did a campaign called Let's Build Together. It was really a social campaign. As I said, we didn't, we didn't have time to go shoot commercials, nor was there any place to shoot them. So we just created digital campaigns and a lot of our designers did videos from home that we also actually leveraged as well. And the idea was to do a social campaign, social, you know, to, to just give people uh, some really um, good ideas about what they could do with the Lego bricks that they already had at home. So it wasn't commercially focused at all. It was just focused on giving people an opportunity to leverage what they had at home to have some enjoyable moments for themselves, for their kids, and also find the ways to celebrate, for example, the frontline workers and deal with the issues that the whole society basically was dealing with. That was very successful. I mean, we had a lot of social engagement, uh, you know, um, um, tens of millions of views. Um, and, you know, that happened very, very fast. So that was also one of the things that you have to do is to be agile in these situations like this. And I think that's something that we learned because in normal situations, you want everything to be perfect. And I think that sometimes becomes a, a massive barrier for people in organizations where in a strive to get to perfection, everything slows down. But when you are 
in a situation like this, where there's a bit of crisis going on, you're, you are forced to move fast. And the good thing is that you learn that you can, and you mm -hmm. learn that you can actually still deliver very good things. And then mm -hmm. that stays with you. So that was a very good learning for us. So as you think about uh, the, the future and if things are opening up in the next month or two, do you, do you anticipate going back to what Lego used to be? Or how do you, are you thinking about incorporating what you've learned during this time you know, to, to make things even more successful? Um, so we are very much focused on the learning um, because one of the key things that we talk about at the Lego group in terms of what a Lego experience delivers to children is learning through play. Mm -hmm. That kids learn to be more resilient. They learn how to deal with obstacles. They learn how to um, learn and learn, relearn, iterate. Um, and that's very much the mantra, as I said, children are role models that we want to also apply internally. We don't believe that the world will go back to what it was before, so nor should we go back to what we were before. We believe the world will evolve, and for sure what will happen will be no less predictable than what happened to us last year, right? So nobody could have predicted this, or maybe we could have predicted it had we looked, had we anticipated that some of the things that are unthinkable could actually happen. But we're definitely more ready for the unpredictability of the world. And we have taken a lot of learnings um, and are continuing to incorporate them in how we go to market, how we develop our campaigns, and for sure, um, how to stay more agile as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the sort of key uh, things that you're doing is setting up brand partnerships with you know, Porsche and others. How do you think about who is a good partner and how have you approached that, uh, that whole sphere? Uh, it's, uh, we, we have a lot of really great partnerships. Um, the Lego brand is is very important to us. I mean, we, we and we're very passionate about preserving the values of the brand. So we have very stringent criteria of how we select partners. But first and foremost, we, it has to be about shared values. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we always look for, um, you know, ensuring that, that the brands are really relevant for audiences. You know, mm -hmm. there's no use doing something because we think it's cool. We, we need to make sure that our audiences really appreciate, um, you know, what, what the other brands bring. Um, we always want to have complementarity. And then there is the magic that happens in a great partnership where you can actually set the same goals and you can work well together. And I, I wouldn't underestimate how important that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have a, obviously a huge sort of global following. And as you mentioned, you're, you have products for adults, you have products for uh, you know, others as well. Uh, how do you think about engaging this group of sort of fans, if you will? I mean, they're not just customers, right? They are, they're very passionate about the product. How do you think about uh, addressing them, not just as people buying your product, but as people who are part of this community? Uh, it's, a, it's a really great question. And I think that's one of the things that makes the Lego brand very unique is that it really belongs to its communities. Um, and, you know, the, even though um, our number one priority is children, we actually have a lot of, uh, we've, we put a lot of focus on building safe digital communities for kids. Um, so we engage with them as well. But I think your question is more about adults. The adult fans have always been very important to us. So we've always had focus on maintaining very strong engagement. Um, and we actually, I have people in my organization dedicated to our adult fan community. Um, so we, we have a very strong relationship with them. We have Lego certified professionals. Some of them are extremely well known because they have uh, developed, some of them have contributed to some of our lines, for example, Lego architecture. Some of them are very well known for the shows that they do around the world that, that people enjoy. Uh, and you could see a lot of the content that they post on our uh, various social media channels. Um, last, uh, well, a year and a half ago, we bought uh, Bricklink, which was um, an independent uh, site that was specifically focused on um, uh, the fans of the Lego brick, the adult fans of Lego, we call them, and providing them with an opportunity to showcase their designs, but also with a marketplace to buy the bricks that they wanted to buy. So that also allowed us to strengthen the relationship even further uh, through that acquisition. And we are very strongly connected into the Brickling community as well. And I was super happy to see that we actually acquired more and more fans. Mm -hmm. um, and very attentive. We're very attentive to our fans. They, they give us tremendous advice. Uh, they know um, 
our products really well. We listen to them because they're probably the first ones always to give us comments on new products. So their voices are very important to us. They give us really good input into how we develop um, our overall portfolio over time. Um, and, you know, obviously we love connecting with them because they also come up with very strong innovation ideas that we also incorporate. Um, we also have the Lego Ideas platform where anybody can post their design. They have to build it out of existing bricks. And then we have a community that votes. And if uh, they receive over 10,000 votes, then um, we launch a few of those sets every year. So there's a lot of different things that we do, but it's definitely a dialogue and communication uh, with the adult fans. Mm -hmm. So we had a question uh, that was submitted from the audience saying Lego sets are getting more and more intricate to the point that in many cases, they're simply out of reach for 10 to 15 year old boys. Are you changing your niche targeting mix? Um, no, the answer is absolutely not. We actually target kids of all ages. Um, uh, and as I said, we also have sets that are dedicated for adults to adults. Um, I wouldn't say that, 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 that it's an interesting feedback to hear because we are actually very um, attuned to how people build and how kids build, especially as they get older. And what I've been hearing is that there's a lot of 13 year old plus, you know, teens who basically maybe built Lego sets before and then they dropped out. But during the last year, they've all come back in and are, you know, being very proud of the fact that they're they're building again and they, they really love the more intricate sets. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's true to say that um there there are you know products that we have introduced over the last few years that are 18 plus that are very intricate and difficult to build. But if you look at the age markings, uh you know we haven't changed the level of difficulty for the different age groups. Usually the ones that are super challenging would be 18 plus like the Lamborghini Technic Lamborghini would be an example of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so you spoke about um, the Japan and sort of the, the, the difficulties of being a senior woman there. Could you just talk about your leadership journey as a woman? And in, did you have any mentors, people who, you know, took sort of special interest in, uh, in, in cultivating you and, and making you a successful leader? Um, well, firstly, I don't consider my leadership journey as a leadership journey as a woman. I think it was just a leadership journey of a leader. Um, and I, I certainly um, look at it that way. Um, it was a, you know, it, it was a very interesting journey because I think um, that all through, you know, the last 20 plus years that I have been leading uh, people, I have been learning more and more about leadership. And I think that journey of being a great leader never stops. I think you can only get better and you always learn something new every year um, about leading people um, and leading people through challenges like I had to do last year, uh, leading people when you can't be live with them, you know? So there's things that come up all the time. Um, I haven't, I never had specific mentors that mentored me but I was lucky to work with different types of people. And I was lucky to also have some coaching experiences um, that really helped me to evolve as a leader and helped me to get to know myself better and to understand better how to lead others. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely would say that my leadership journey was um, not an easy one. I think I learned a lot along the way and I've definitely had some crash and burn situations with my own leadership where I had to really figure out how to evolve my style or how to think differently about situations. Uh, but what I, what I really um, enjoyed and what I benefited from is that I did have people that I worked with or worked for who believed in me and were able to give me chances. And I also really benefited from the fact that I had people who uh, were very honest with me. And I think these are ingredients are really important. One, honesty and transparency. So you're not walking around with people not telling you exactly what you're doing wrong or how you're being how you are being perceived or how you're coming across or how you're making people feel. And uh, secondly, you know, giving people a chance. I think that is so important that you have support and that somebody is willing to give you an opportunity to step up. And I've been lucky to have both of those things. Uh, not always from the same people, but both of those things in my uh, in my journey. 
Um, so let me speak a little bit just to ask you about marketing itself. The field now probably, I mean, it's changed dramatically. And maybe you could just talk a little bit about how marketing itself has evolved over the last sort of 20, 25 years. And just going back to your, uh, the, the classes you might have done at Booth and, and you know, how they played a role and just how the field has moved. That would be very interesting, I think, for our audience. Yeah. So I, my um, experience with marketing um, has been that, in, you know, that in the last um, 15 years or so, it became marginalized. And what I mean is that there was a traditional view of marketing. Now, if you think about marketing at it, its very inception, it was really about value creation. It was about understanding human insight, consumer insight, understanding unmet needs and creating products uh, that met them and then creating marketing campaigns around it, you know, that really uh, enabled people to engage in a relevant way with, you know, whatever it is that you were offering. So that was sort of like the premise of marketing. And that's definitely what I learned when I went to Booth. That's what I fell in love with, is that idea of understanding your, your consumers really well, understanding their lives, understanding what matters to them, their attitudes, uh, anticipating what they weren't getting, and then figuring out how to deliver value against that and how to engage them um, in the idea that you're you know, promoting. But I think that marketing over time became very marginalized. And the reason it got marginalized is because I think organizations became more functionally oriented. And suddenly, you know, you had digital experts and marketers were sort of sitting on the sideline. And I think it took time for the marketing community to actually realize the fact that the premise of marketing has not changed. The, the, you know, the circumstances changed because now you had digital channels that were available to you. Now you have change in the media landscape. Now you had a change in the retail landscape because you, there was e-commerce. Um, but the idea is still the same. You still need to build brands. You just need to be able to build them in a new environment. So I really did not like where marketing was going, to be honest with you, because I felt like you had digital people, uh, then you had something else and something. Everything was getting very fragmented and marketing was becoming very narrow. And my other really big belief is that marketing has to be has to be at the center of value creation and not there just to push a product that somebody else created. But of course, the more digital products there were, the more marketing became kind of a side uh, discipline, not a value creation discipline. My view is different. My view is that marketing has to be at the center of value creation, that marketers still need to be fully responsible for understanding fully consumer insight, for understanding how you know, their audiences live their lives, what's important to them. And they should be influencing, if they're not running product development, at least they should be influencing innovation and they need to be innovating across the board. And what that requires is a lot of learning on the job. And I think this is where, you know, my generation didn't necessarily go right. You know, I think that marketers need to learn more than anyone else. You know, they need to be curious, externally oriented. You can't constantly replenish the organization because things evolve all the time. So if you're looking for new people to come in who are going to be experts in streaming services, for example, well, by the time they come into your organization, it will move on to something else. So I think that the better thing that needs to happen with marketers is this continuous uh, learning. Uh, continuous learning and ability to change. That is a unique skill. And again, in my view, marketing has to be the function that actually uh, is excellent at the skill of iteration, changing, um, you know, unlearning what they know and changing it and learning and, and doing something different. And so very much like the innovation and product development. So in your view, those two should actually sort of go together. Yeah, and maybe I'm biased because I've, you know, I've already been, you know, in the last 13 years, I have been doing both. So maybe that is what creates the bias, or maybe that is what is leading me in my conviction that mm -hmm. I actually think that they're not that distinct and need mm -hmm. to be connected. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, one of the questions, uh, things that Lego has done is again, these very interesting partnerships and, and, and connecting in very different ways. 
maybe you could say a little bit about the movie and how that came about so the first lego movie happened before my time it actually launched in 2014 and i joined the company like about six or seven months later but it was it was something that was okay let's try it there was a uh, you know a really great idea and we wanted to see um you know we were kind of willing to go and explore it um, but what it showed is that there was so much pent up desire and interest in what you could do with the, you know, with the Lego brick. Mm-hmm. And for sure, the Lego brick, you know, lends itself to all kinds of different genre. So after the first Lego movie, we had Lego Batman, which was really funny. And then you had Lego Ninjago, which really appealed to kids. And then we had Lego Movie 2. Um, and then, since, you know, since then, what we have learned is that you know, you can develop a lot of really exciting content with the Lego brick and, you know, people are super interested in it. So right now we don't have any movies out there, but we have Lego Masters, which is a TV show. It's not a TV show created by us, same as with the movie. It wasn't created by us. It was, you know, it was a couple of really great movie makers supported by Warner Brothers Studios. Same with Lego Masters. It wasn't created by us. It's, um, it's independent, but it has become, a, you know, a hugely popular show. Uh, around the world. So it's already in quite a few markets and it continues to go. And every time it's on, you know, it's one of the best rated shows. So we are like really excited to see that happen. So it just gives you um, a a sense of how much is possible with the Lego brick. Uh, So I think we have a bunch of questions coming in. So maybe I'll turn it over to Penka to uh, bring some of those up. Penka. Thank you, Madhav. Uh, And thanks to all of you who have submitted uh, quite a few questions. I'm trying to group them a little bit uh, for Julia here. So Julia, if we could go back a little bit to to Lego. Um, Lots of questions came in about the mission that you mentioned and Lego as an educational tool. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some new ideas, strategies, maybe focus on certain age groups that might be happening right now, given the pandemic and the overall strategy? Yeah. So I think first thing, um, I will explain the, the kind of essence of what I was talking about when I talk about Lego and learning through play. And that is the fact that um, we know that uh, one of the really important things uh, in, in kids' lives is play. Uh, after safety, of course, and nutrition, um, play and family, um, play is very important because when kids play, they learn. And they learn very important skills. And I know that, and you know, any experience that's really engaging, that immerses them, and gives them an opportunity to um, explore different possibilities, yeah. gives them an opportunity for this kind of learning. So we talk, for example, with the fact that six million uh, or six Lego bricks, two by four, simple two by four Lego bricks. Yeah. Uh, of the same color can be turned into 915 million different combinations. And so that kind of iteration, you know, to a child, a combination (laughs) is, is, is an airplane or a dock or, you know, a building. So it, it really uh, stirs up their imagination. It gives them an opportunity to also try new things for sure fail, which is so important that they actually learn how to do things differently. Uh, and it gives them creative resilience and builds their self-esteem. And these are the most important skills for 21st century, much more important than the technical learning, um, which is also important, of course. But you've got to, you know, we know 60% of kids that are kids today will have jobs that don't exist today. So we need to prepare them for the unexpected. So all of our experience as are geared to develop, to deliver that learning through play. That's also why some of the sets seem to be a bit more difficult because we want kids to be able to experience, you know, what it's like to troubleshoot and figure out how to do things differently or for sure to build something that is not even in the instructions. But we also know that this kind of learning is also very conducive to the academic environment. So we actually have an arm called Lego Education, where we develop products particularly focused on, you know, helping students um, to uh, have hands-on learning, where they can build things, they can make experiments, they can code. What we have seen during the pandemic is that 
the lines are blurring because kids were off school and parents were really interested in more learning experiences for their children. So some of these products actually are available also to buy for in-home use and they're absolutely usable. You know, we've also launched, um, we launched Lego Mindstorms where they can code, they can build robots and they can code them and they have different variations of what they can build. Um, we are very much focused on preschool. We have a Duplo brand that targets um, very young kids from 18 months to you know, about three years. And we are even more focused on, we know how kids develop and what they learn. So we want to make sure that we're giving them those really important experiences, both in terms of facilitating their learning of like alphabet, for example, or what happens in the city or what happens on the farm. But at the same time, also getting them hands-on learning, getting them to build. So those would be like a few things to mention. But of course, as I said up front, all of our experience experiences are geared to uh, deliver uh, learning through play moment. Yeah, I love this idea of parents learning together with their children and uh, the coding. That's quite uh, something nice. Um, another uh, topic related a little bit to strategies at LEGO. Several people were asking about how to move forward given the sustainability and focus on producing environmentally friendly products. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more how LEGO is thinking about this and what the next steps might, might be there? Were you involved? Sure. Um, so for us, sustainability is very important. It's one of the, um, you know, really important uh, focus areas that we are also uh, vocal about. You know, we actually post some of our sustainability um, objectives in terms of our supply chain, environmental sustainability, et cetera. Um, we, ha we have uh, different areas of focus when it comes to sustainability. So firstly, of course, uh, fully sustainable supply chain um these kinds of um, targets are um, in our annual report we also have a sustainability report that we um, publish every year um, but we're also very cognizant of sustainability of the materials with which we work um, now the lego bricks are very sustainable because they're reusable i mean they last for years and years and years um, having said that, we know that there is a, you know, overall interest in ensuring that we have fully sustainable materials. We actually have sustainable materials as part of the Lego um, already uh, as part of the sort of what we call system of place. So we have some elements that are made out of cane sugar. So they're, you know, fully sustainable and they happen to be plant kind of, they're plant-based and they're plant elements. So they're like leaves and flowers. So we call them plants from plants and they have been very um, successful, but they still represent a relatively small proportion of the overall um, set that, of bricks that we have. And we're constantly looking and investing in developing sustainable materials, but it is not a, an easy road um, for organizations because there's, you know, in general, in general, it's not so easy to find great material and not one hasn't been found yet that has all the functionalities that you need, including durability. Um, in terms of packaging, we are moving uh, also on that agenda. We announced that we are going to move to paper prepack um, packaging from plastic, and that's already happening in 2021. So we are very well on that journey, as well as all the other packaging um, you know, that, 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 that we use. So it's a really important journey, and we take it very seriously. Great. Looking back a little bit further in your entire career, um, can you talk a little bit more about some of the biggest product innovations that you have overseen and some of the challenges that you might have faced bringing those innovations to life? Anything that comes to mind here? You've spoken a lot about innovation. It seems to be a recurring theme in your career, which is great. That's what we try to teach our students as well. Um, well, I, I think probably, um, maybe the best thing to do is to talk about the things, things that are most recent. So in um, last year, so in 2020 in July, we launched Lego Super Mario, um, which is a, a very interesting experience for those of you who are Super Mario lovers, um, which, are, which is basically a, a completely different way of playing out Super Mario game you build it with bricks, but you also have an interactive uh, Super Mario character, 
so you can actually game in a physical environment, which is just never happened before. I think it's, it's the first of its kind. Uh, we worked very closely with Nintendo. This is a very long process to actually develop innovation like that. It's technically um, very intricate and very challenging, but it also requires you know, huge collaboration, working with partners, because you're talking about two very valuable brands with very you know, very, very important um, values and benefits and functionality and aesthetics. And all of that needs to be taken into account and in bringing something like this to life. So in innovation like this, you know, you have many uh, situations where, you know, you're looking at an innovation idea and you think, wow, this is just not going to go anywhere. This play experience doesn't work or this technology cannot work. And we for sure had many challenges like that along the way. So it wasn't a smooth, let's say, sailing all the way through, but it was an example of an innovation that I think has really demonstrated um, this new way of playing, uh, fluid, what we call fluid play, where kids want to see in digital world coming together with the physical world. And I think um, in that particular space uh, is, is, is one of the most successful, if not the most successful uh, innovation launch um, in a long, long time, if not ever. So that would be one that I would say I'm very proud of. What was, you know, what was really challenging about it is the fact that not only the whole experience to get to, you know, it's a pretty big, brave decision you have to take to say, well, I'm going to go with this because you have to do it with, you know, you have to make these kinds of choices way before you actually launch the product. But I think the other thing about it, of course, was that it, we had to finalize it and, and kind of develop, you know, get it to market during COVID times. And as I said, you know, with a product like that, you want to give a lot of hands-on experiences. We couldn't do any hands-on experiences whatsoever because all the stores were closed. So we had to change everything to a digital marketing type of experience, but it was still, you know, the most successful launch that we've had of a new product ever. So I'm very proud of this one. Uh, I would say that was, um, you know, that was definitely a big success. Um, but, you know, big successes don't happen um, by accident. Big successes also happen because certain things don't work out as well as, you, you, know, you know, don't work exactly as you think or, you know, you launch things that you know you're going to, um, you know, probably uh, not succeed with to the same extent, but you will learn a lot from. So I think all really big breakthroughs like that stand on the shoulders of many things that you try that don't work out as well. Yeah. Now, my personal question is, do you get to try the products before they are launched on the market? You personally? Any of the um, new products or the new sets? Yeah, yeah I mean, but, but I, I don't build them to okay them going to the market because I have so many, you know, we, we have absolute experts in putting together the products and the building instructions. So that's not the purpose. I, I definitely get to see them and I get to look around and see all the models, but before they hit the market, usually they hit my office. So I get a chance to build them before anybody else does. That's the question. <laughs> Julia, if we can switch gears a little bit to your uh, leadership uh, journey once more. So I think you manage about 1,800 people. Um, and the question came in, tell us a little bit more about challenges and opportunities. It's a large group of, group of people. You had to help them through um, the transition, working from home now, you know, perhaps a new way of working. What is it like to be uh, a leader of so many people? In some ways, I always like to say to people who look at these big numbers that if you can lead five people well, then you can lead 1,800 people well. Because you know, at the end of the day, it's about your ability to lead. Um, but if I'm, you know, I've heard that answer myself before many times, um, and I know that it's maybe not enough. So I'll just be really open about what has happened over the last year. You know, one of the key things that you want to have as a leader is proximity to people because people need to feel you, sense you, understand where you're coming from, you know, understand what you're, why you're setting the direction that you're setting. And at the end of the day, you also need to be able to hear from people. 
And of course, it becomes increasingly more difficult when you don't have an opportunity to travel or be in the same office with people and walk around and ask them questions. But I actually realized that my leadership um, uh, improved significantly during the COVID times because I had to find new ways to connect with people. And one of the things that has happened is, you know, from the very beginning is that I realized that I could only communicate with them like this. But actually what I found is that you get to touch more people like this because more people can join and they can listen to you and you can interact. So I, I did both um, kind of the, the bigger the bigger town halls like this on, on, on Zoom, we use Teams, but it's the same thing. But I also did a lot of dialogue sessions with a group of three, four, five people just to hear what people had to say. And the other thing that I started doing was to be much more open about my life. And this is another big lesson for me as a leader is that you know authenticity is also about proximity and being able to relate to a person and you know, usually executives are not seen as, you know, hugely relatable, or there's maybe, you know, people think, well, they have different kind of life. But, I, you know, I was very open about my life. I had two kids, you know, I had one that was homeschooling, I was going nuts and pulling my hair out, and he was joining my schools. And I think for people to see that I was sharing the recipes that I was making, I was living exactly the same life as everybody else and dealing with the same issues, elderly parents, you know, and that really um, enabled people to relate better to me and it enabled me to, to, to have more authentic and open conversations with people. And I wrote, I shared a lot more on, you know, like Yammer posts and just shared what I was experiencing myself. So authenticity, openness, um, you know, building this kind of proximity, I don't want to lose that. So even when we go back to, you know, things being the way they were. I think I found that actually being connected like that very informally worked extremely well. So I would want to retain that. Yeah, great lessons for all of us, actually. Um, here's another question. What was the turning point in your career that helped you become the leader you are today? Was there a, a pivotal moment or a lesson learned or a failure that um, you have kept as a sort of a milestone in your career development or in your leadership development? I think that um, it was a, a gradual journey and I don't think it's over yet. So I could say maybe uh, coming to the Lego group was a pivotal moment, but actually if I really force myself to think there are pivotal moments before, before then as well. Um, the, my experience at the Lego group has definitely been, um, you know, one of the more pivotal moments. And the reason for that is because I joined an organization with very strong value set, you know, extremely strong values, very ingrained way of doing things and an organization that was at that time, hugely successful. And I think to become an effective leader, especially when you're coming into an area, like you said, up front, uh, very uh, astutely, you know, <laughs> people were going, well, you've never, you haven't done this, you know, you hear the most, um, you know, that's not the way we've, we've, we do things here or uh, we've tried this before and it didn't work. Yeah. So feeling uncomfortable was something that no one wanted to do. And I was making them very uncomfortable. And I had to learn how to become an authentic leader. And it takes two to tango. I have to be honest, the organization moved closer to me, but I also moved closer to the organization. So that was definitely a pivotal moment for me. Um, to realize how to be, how, you know, and I evolved hugely as a leader leading in the level group. But one of the things that happened to me early in, earlier in my career that I remember very well, and I talked about the moments of honesty, I, I had a boss who was very honest with me, he was also very supportive. Um, but it was also when I started a new assignment. And, you know, I was you know, I, I, I had a lot of vision and passion and, but I was leading a pretty big organization already. And I remember, you know, I achieved a ton in my first year and I sat down expecting that he's gonna say, wow, you know, this has been extraordinary and you have, you're an extraordinary performer. And he said to me, um, you know, you, you've achieved a lot, but I'm gonna give you this not so great review. And I said, why? And he said, because you're leaving your team behind. They say that you're flying at 30,000 feet, 
you know, you have a lot of ideas, you land, uh, you know, you talk to them for a bit and then you, you, you're back up in the sky and you, there's a bunch of debris behind you. And I realized that I was moving forward, but I wasn't bringing the people with me. And so I started to focus a lot more on how you create fellowship, how you create understanding. I slowed down and I started to really, um, you know, prioritize and focus. And I think that for me was a pivotal moment in, in my leadership and in understanding how to lead big organizations. Yeah, uh, great. We have time for two more questions. So um, simp I'll ask a sh shorter ones. Uh, lifelong learning, that's a big um, strategy for us at Chicago Booth. We offer a lot. Tell us a little bit more about your lifelong learning. And I also mean this in a um, more light way, uh, books, movies, anything that you're doing to keep going with the learning. Yeah, um, so I think learning and training is uh, very important. And, and to me, that is kind of a fabric of life. Like I think learning something new is incredibly, um, you know, it, it, it is important in order to, for me personally to feel like I'm developing. And that comes both professionally as well as um, personally. And maybe part of what drives that is because I was, um, when I was younger, I was, um, I actually studied to be a pianist. So I played the piano for a long time and then I gave it up completely, but I play. And I, you know, now I learn, I still learn new pieces. And with piano, you know, you can't stand still. You have to constantly learn. Either you are going to be evolving or you're going to get worse. So I kind of feel that way about life as well, that you can't just stay still and say, oh, I've learned. Because either you're going to continue evolving or if you stop learning, you're going to go down. So for me, this is a kind of a, a really important part of life, but at the same time, very fluid because I learned through many different things. You know, I, I, I listen to podcasts, I pick up books. I have a ton of books. I can't finish any of them because I don't have time. So I'll be super open about that, but I will take a book and I will start looking and I'll read a couple of chapters and I'll go back to it, especially some professional books. I think the benefit of them is that you don't have to read them from front to cover all the time, but it's good to dip in and out. Um, I'm definitely, as I said before, I realized that, you know, marketers have allowed the marketing profession to be narrowed because they didn't want to learn enough. And I learn all the time. I seek out people in my organization and I ask them to teach me, um, you know, uh, how digital products get developed, uh, what are the different acronyms, you know, uh, how to work in agile. There's always new things to learn. So I, I look at it very naturally, but the other thing as well, that I learned actually at Chicago Booth. I had a great professor um, and that's one experience that stayed with me. As he said, there's two very important questions anytime you look at a piece of data. One is how do you know? So when people say something, it's like this, how do you know? What, what is the context for that fact and what are you comparing to? And the second one is so what? And I love the so what question because every time that I, see something new. For me, the question, so what, turns it from an experience into learning. So that's a really important for me. I can watch uh, a very enjoyable, entertaining series on Netflix, but if I ask myself the so what question, it will result in something that I'm going to take away from it that actually could translate into further action. Um, I don't know yet where or when, but it will apply itself. Um, so that's my kind of way of learning, but it extends to everything. And I'd, I'm not afraid to try things. So that's another thing that I picked up in, in the Lego group is that we are authorized to fail. You know, failure is not an issue. They call it the Super Mario effect. If you're not afraid to fail, you're more likely to learn a lot more and to get to better successes. So I do that with a lot of things, whether it's piano or recipes, you know, or cutting my kid's hair, you learn. Nice. I love your Chicago Booth episode, Julia. Um, given the time, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. And I'll give it back to Mara. Yeah, thank you, Julia. This was fascinating and uh, it was incredibly insightful and interesting. And we are very, very proud of what you've accomplished as, uh, as somebody who, uh, who came to Chicago Booth. Um, 
And we really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your candor during, uh, during this conversation. So thank you again for taking the time and uh, continued great success to you. Thank you everyone for thank participating. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the first great experience. Thank you, we appreciate that. See you everyone.